going to go ahead and continue where we left off a couple weeks ago, um, and uh, we'll be in Joshua chapter 14 this morning, Joshua chapter 14, and I've titled today's message, A Reward for Patient Loyalty. Now, back when I covered chapter 13 with you all a couple weeks ago, last time we were together, I mentioned a character that wasn't necessarily, it wasn't in chapter 13, and so I, I know that it might have confused you a little bit, and if it did, I, I apologize, and, and the reason I brought him up is that even though he's not named in that chapter, Caleb is an important character in the next few chapters that we're going to be covering, well, specifically in this chapter here. Now, chapter 14, it divides into two sections, land to be distributed and Caleb's request of Hebron. Of Hebron. Now, each section is followed by a comment indicating faithfulness. And so the first part of our reading that we're going to be doing, we're going to be reading today, it's going to be more, it's going to be me basically explaining the passage. The real meat and potatoes of today's message, of today's sermon, is going to be in the second half. And here's something that I hope that you learn today, that I hope that the Lord speaks to you about as I go through this message. Christ our ruler, the ruler who came to serve God and others, calls us, calls believers to render service to others through the fruit of the spirit of humility rather than through competition. So before I begin getting into chapter 14 and start reading, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, as Pastor Isaac prayed, we are so thankful you have us here. Lord, I pray that you will uh, reveal to us the things that we need to know and understand, Lord. New truths, new understandings. We want to draw near to you, Lord. Some people here are just going through really difficult times. Lord, and, and they desperately need to hear your voice, need to fall in love with you even more and depend on you even more. Not just here, but those that are watching as well. I pray that you will speak to them powerfully and that this message will also go out pow powerfully. So now we ask that you protect us here now, Lord. Watch over us. Fill this room with your spirit. So we now sit your feet and hear your word. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Joshua chapter 14, verse 1. And the word of God says, the Israelites received these portions that the priest Eleazar, Joshua, son of Nun, and the family heads of the Israelite tribes gave them in the land of Canaan. Their inheritance was by lot, as the Lord commanded through Moses, for the nine and a half tribes. Because Moses had given the inheritance to the two and a half tribes beyond the Jordan. But he gave no inheritance among them to the Levites. The descendants of Joseph became two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. No portion of the land was given to the Levites except cities to live in along with pasture lands, pasture lands for their cattle and livestock. So the Israelites did as the Lord commanded Moses, and they divided the land. This chapter begins with the distribution of the land on the west side of the Jordan to the nine and a half tribes if you remember, again, the two and a half tribes on the east side had already been given their lands, and they had made a promise that they would back up and fight alongside their fellow brothers, the other tribes, 
and in order to conquer the land. So now that that's been done, you know, they're, you know, they have those lands already. Now these verses, they also introduce us, introduces us to the main characters in the land distribution. Joshua and Eleazar and the heads of the tribes or the heads of the clans. Now, aside from Joshua being identified as son of Nun, not much is said here about Eleazar, but other Old Testament passages do. Exodus chapter 6, Numbers chapter 20, and Deuteronomy chapter 10 explain that Eleazar was the son of Aaron, his successor and the official leader of the Levites. Numbers 27, chapter 27, verses 19 through 22, also says that he used the Urim and the Thummim, <coughs> Thummim to determine God's will and to allot all the tribal lands. Now, the other group that's mentioned that are involved in land distribution are the heads of the Israelite tribes. Most likely, these were the same men that are mentioned in Numbers chapter 34. Well then, according to God's instructions in Numbers chapter 34, Joshua, Eliezer, and one leader per tribe were to distribute the land. And so what verse 1 is showing us is that Israel was really making an effort here. They were really making an effort to obey God's commands. Now, addition, in addition to being told of who was involved in the land distribution, verse 2 also informs us the method that the allocations of Canaan were to be made. Their inheritance was by lot, Something, again, they were instructed to do by God back in Numbers chapter 26. According to Jewish tradition, the name of the tribe of a tribe was drawn from one urn, and simultaneously the boundary lines of a territory from another urn. But here's the thing. Bl blind chance didn't decide tribal location. No, it wasn't blind chance. It wasn't, you know, see who gets lucky. It wasn't that. Rather, it was God himself who was in control of the lot the entire time. He was in control. And so all the problems that existed and that caused tension, tensions and jealousies among the tribes regarding what assignments they were given was just foolishness. All those quarrels, all those fights, all those little civil wars they had because, oh, your land is greener than mine and your land is big, you know, bigger, you have more stuff. It, it, it was dumb. It was really foolish. All that infighting could have been avoided had they just accepted the fact that their lot was part of God's purpose. It was His purpose. Verses 3 and 4 then give us, gives us a review of the Transjordanian Jordanian tribes. Transjordanian tribes. Manasseh and Ephraim and the Levites. The eastern tribes had already been given their lands, but the Levites, the Levites, those poor Levites, received no major lands except cities to live in, along with pasture lands for their cattle and livestock. Now, it's not mentioned here, but the priest also received certain portions from the sacrifices as they're due. And both the priests and the Levites shared in the special tithes and offerings that the people were commanded to bring. 
So they had a special place and they were given, you know, they, they just were given a little extra because of what their position was among the tribes. But other factors were probably involved in scattering, in scattering the tribe of Levi. For one thing, God didn't want tribal responsibilities to distract the priests and Levites. He wanted them to devote themselves fully, fully to serving him. Also, he wanted them to be the salt and light in the land as they lived among the people and taught them the land. Verse 4 also explains the math of the number of tribes. Jacob had 12 sons, but the descendants of one of those, one of these tribes, Joseph, became two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, both receiving inheritance, inheritances. And so the Levites' landless, landless condition kept the number of tribal territories fixed at 12. And so this explains why you can have two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan River, nine and a half tribes on the west side of the Jordan River, and one tribe with no province as their inheritance. And so this introduction to the land grant closes with the notice of Israel's faithfulness in dividing the land in verse 5. Now, from here on forward, from verse 6 to chapter 19, two long allotment reports confirm this claim by de detailing distinct phases of distribution. So the first allotment phase we're going to be reading about next probably takes place at Gilgal, Israel's home base near Jericho and involves Judah, Ephraim, and West Manasseh. So now let's turn with me as I continue on in Joshua chapter 14, verse 6. The descendants of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb's son, son of uh, Jephunneh, Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord promised Moses, Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the Lord's servant, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to scout the land, and I brought back an honest report. My brothers who went with me caused the people to lose heart, but I followed the Lord my God completely. On that day... Moses swore to me, the land where you have set foot will be an inheritance for you and your descendants forever because you have followed the Lord my God completely. As you see, the Lord has kept me alive these 40 years as he promised since, since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel was journeying in the wilderness. Here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was the day Moses sent me out. My strength for battle and for daily tasks is now, is now as, it is, as it was then. Now give me this hill country the Lord promised me on that day. Because you heard, you heard then what, that the Anakim are there, as well as large fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me, and I will drive them out as the Lord promised. Then Joshua blessed Caleb's son, Caleb, son of Jeph Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron still belongs to Caleb, son of Jeph Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, as an inheritance today, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, completely. Hebron's name was, used to be Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man, man 
among the Anakim. After this, the land had rest from war. In verse 6, Caleb and a group from his tribe approached Joshua, the leader of the Israelite, the entire Israelite congregation. Caleb remembered those times when the nation of Israel was in a difficult position. Other than Joshua and Caleb, all the original adults that had lived during that time in the wilderness had died during the 38 years, almost 40 years in the wilderness. And now Caleb and Joshua could say by God's grace that they were the only ones who survived that wilderness death march. Even though others died, God had brought them through. Seriously, what a blessed memory Caleb had. Both of them, Caleb and Joshua, were able to look back and say, Look where he brought me from. Kadesh Barnea is the place of crisis, a turning point, a place of deliverance and rescue. Now that the Israelites had seized control of Canaan, Canaan, it's time to act on the business of securing the territorial inheritance the Lord promised Caleb 45 years ago. Joshua remembered hearing Moses give the message from the Lord concerning the faithful servant. But since my servant Caleb has a different spirit and has remained loyal to me. There in verse 24. Caleb plays some scenic reruns for Joshua of that unfortunate day when God delayed Israel's inheritance or entrance into the promised land. The people, they were all delayed for nearly 40 years because at Kadesh Barnea, Israel balked and refused to cross over into Canaan and fight its people. And we know now what it says there, that Caleb was 40 at that time. Now, even though the ten spies gave over to unbelief, it wasn't so with Caleb. Caleb followed completely. Three times a form of expression occur, occurs in this chapter. In verse 8, But I followed the Lord my God completely. Verse 9, Because you have followed the Lord my God completely. And verse 14, because the Lord, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, completely. Now, I'm not sure if you knew this, but in Hebrew, the name Caleb means dog. So you see, Caleb was like a dog who had gone to, to canine training school and followed the master's direction with devotion without turning to the right or to the left. Caleb followed the Lord without exception. He believed the Lord's promise to keep him alive and received what was promised. God made him a promise, made a promise to Caleb when Caleb was 40 years old. And now, 45 years later, he's now 85. Let me tell you this, church, a believer who remains in the will of God is immortal until God's purpose for his or, or her life is fulfilled. How long can we wait on the promise of God to be, be fulfilled in our lives? Time doesn't matter, my friends. Whether it takes four years, 
40 years or 45 years, we must remember this. God is not in time. God is not in time. Time is in God. If God said it, He will do it. If God said it, He will do it. Let me give you some biblical examples of what this looks like. In the New Testament days, if you remember this story, Simeon, the priest, did not die before God's promise to him was fulfilled. Mary and Joseph entered the temple with the infant Jesus. Luke writes in chapter 2, verse 26, It had been revealed to him, Simeon, by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. So when Simeon saw the baby Jesus, he took him in his arms and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Another example is Paul. After Jesus' ascension, Paul was in a ship with 275 other passengers and crew members bound for Rome. After many days of going without food and not seeing the sun or stars, the passengers and crew panicked and gave up all hope for survival. There was only one person on board who still had hope. It was Paul. Paul testified to the others aboard the ship that the Lord sent an angel at night and told him, this is what he said in Acts chapter 7, 27, verse 24, don't be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear before Caesar. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. But not only that, we have seen even more recent examples that show us that sometimes God's purpose for his children is fulfilled at 39 years of age. Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther King Jr. are examples of this. Both died at 39, one by hanging and one by an assassin's bullet. Sometimes God's purpose isn't fulfilled until the age of 96. The inimitable American preacher, Gardner Calvin Taylor, that's how old he was when he died. Church, the reality is, the truth is, let me just tell you this. We cannot explain God's timing. Maybe you had a parent that died at a really old age, but you had someone else that was close to you, a family member who died at a really young age. In the face of death, especially a young death, believers must cling to the hope of the promised resurrection. The important matter is not, ca- is not counting on the number of years one has, but making the number of years count. Let me repeat that. The important matter is not counting the number of years one has, but making the number of years count. Now, at the age of 85, Caleb claims in verse 11 to be as strong as he was when he was 45 years old, 45 years ago. So is this hyperbole? Is this an extreme exaggeration? Is dementia starting to set in? 
Or is he simply lying? How can a person be as, uh, as strong as a 85? How can a person be as strong at 85 as he was at 40? Caleb even says that he is just as vigorous and dexterous to go into the battlefield as he was 45 years ago. Now, most people you will probably talk to who are advanced in their years will pretty much tell you, yeah, that can't be. I mean, I'm, I'm even starting to, you know, I would probably even tell you, man, no way. I get out of bed and I'm just, my back's hurting, my knees are hurting, you know. I'm sure there's, you know, maybe some of you watching or here, you, you know what I'm talking about. So here, Caleb is saying at 85, man, I'm just as strong as I was when I was 40. Can some will just refute those kind of statements? Because for many, it becomes more difficult to lift objects, objects, go upstairs, bend over and tie up shoes, or do many things that, are, that were previously done without thinking earlier on what well, Joshua claims can be unrealistic. But let me add this. What he says isn't based on physiology. It's not based on phys physiology, my friends. It's based on theology. This could only be possible by God supplying supernatural strength for Caleb to perform extraordinary service. Isaiah's right when he said in chapter 40, verse 31, those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. So, may we be vigilant against the sin of ageism. The word settlement was not in Caleb's vocabulary. Rather, the, war, the word inheritance dominates his thought. Yes, he was from the tribe of Judah and fourth son of Jacob. The fourth son of Jacob. Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. We know that the Messianic promise emerged from this tribe. And there it says, the scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until whose right it is to be it, it comes and the obedience of the peoples belong to him. Here's what I'm getting at. Here's, here's the point. Caleb didn't want the territory of Hebron without a struggle. No, not at all. He said this in verse 12, Now give me this hill country. That is, give me the opportunity to possess it by de defeating the current landlords in it. This is exactly what Caleb did in conquering Hebron. In verse 15, we'll find this out. Caleb drove out from their three sons of Anak, Sheshi, Ahiman, and Talmai, the, the descendants of Anak. Caleb was successful not because of his senior strength, but because of his strength in the sovereign one. Strength beyond Caleb's strength. Again, verse 12, he says, Perhaps the Lord will be with me, and I will drive them out as the Lord promised. And so is, I mention that because is perhaps a word that indicates faith? One commentator, 
Dale Ralph Davis, Davis thinks so. And he wrote this. Taken as a whole, Caleb's words in verse 12 simply exude expectancy. Perhaps it may, it may be, who knows what Yahweh will do, will, uh, what Yahweh will be pleased to do if I throw myself to his situation. There is faith that looks upon a faithful, almighty God who delights to surprise his people with his goodness. A faith that loves to venture itself on such a God. The story of Caleb and his quest for his inheritance ends with these celebratory words in verses 13 and 14. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron still belongs to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite as an inheritance today, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, completely. Caleb's great strength was his willingness to play second fiddle to Joshua, behind Joshua. The first fiddle in God's symphony orchestra of leadership and service. Second fiddle or the second instrumental section in the, orchestra, in the orchestra is the most difficult. Yet Caleb played second fiddle without competing with Joshua, who played first. He knew where God had called him, and he served with Joshua corporatively and not competitively. He served, keep this in mind, he served without jealousy. In life, it's difficult to be a maid of honor when one wants to be the bride. Or to be a best man when one longs to be the groom. In sports, it can be discouraging going to all the practices knowing that you will sit on the bench during the game because you did not make it the first string. Graduating students who demonstrate excellence in academics relish the opportunity to, get the, to give the valedictorian address during the graduation ceremony. But many instead are chosen just to give the salutation address. Even in church, a trained and effective pastor teacher may only find total fulfillment in being a senior pastor or director of a Christian school. Yet he or she may only become one of the staff, or just a teacher. Our Lord, our Lord was willing to play second fiddle in salvation history. He explained, Paul captures the reality of this truth in the well-known passage that he almost seems to be singing about after saying this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Who, and this is the part I'm talking about, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming, by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, I cut off the rest of that passage, but I'm sure you can look it up. Taking on the form of humanity, he played second fiddle. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as a believer, as a born again believer, as a follower of Christ, you must be loyal to God 
in all things. Caleb asked for the hill country in Hebron to conquer. Jesus went to the hill of Calvary, allowing himself to be conquered by death, and then to conquer death three days later by rising from the dead. Christ, Jesus, who is preeminently first in his exalted state, was willing to step down to the depths of humiliation, only to be elevated back to the heights of glory. If Christ came not to be served, to be served, but to serve as second fiddle to his father, should you as a believer not also do the same? This is why I contend Christ, the ruler who came to serve God and others, calls believers to render service to others through the fruit of the spirit of humility rather than through competition. There's a movie that came out several years ago. Several, I think it's called Sully, right? With, with, uh, it was an airborne pilot, uh, Tom Hanks. Was that what it was called? Sully. If you guys aren't familiar with the story, let me share it, share something about it. On January 15, 2009, Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger left New York LaGuardia's airport on U.S. Flight 1549 with 159, 155 passengers and crew on board. Within minutes of takeoff, a flock of Canadian geese flew into the twin engines of the plane, immobilizing them both and leaving the plane without power. Captain Sullenberger was able to guide the plane and avoid crashing into buildings. He also flew the plane 900 feet over the George Washington Bridge and safely landed it on the Hudson River. 155 passengers and crew members got off the plane at LaGuardia got on the plane at LaGuardia, and 155 walked off onto the plane's wings on the Hudson. There were no casualties. Sully got most of the accolades for his aviation maneuvers and astuteness. However, he remarked that he could not have done this by himself. While he was flying the plane, His co-pilot, Jeff Skiles, was flipping switches. He took a switch flipper, it took a switch flipper to help in the rescue mission, as well as the captain, as well as the captain to guide the powerless plane. Friends, Christ, the ruler who came to serve God and others, calls believers to render service to others through the fruit of the spirit of humility rather than through competition. As Zechariah chapter 4 verse 10 implies, believers should never despise the days of small things. I know I certainly do. Don't. I don't despise them. When the moment we planted this church seven years, more than seven years ago, there at the hotel in front of the movie theater, to now, the church has seen some growth. Sometimes, you know, even there's some weeks we just have two or three people in here, and that's fine. I'm not upset about it. I don't get sad about it. I don't get frustrated. I do. I honestly do. Enjoy it. I don't despise the days of small things because I know that God has a plan. I know that God's going to do something amazing here with this church. Oh, you know, I do think it's going to grow a lot eventually if we remain faithful. If we just, you know, just remain strong. If we stay united as a church. But honestly... Maybe I'm just here 
for a season. May, I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I really, I'm not saying that I'm going to be quitting tomorrow and that's it, or once we get to a certain phase, I'm, I'm out of here. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that he may just have me here right now for this time while we have this group of people. And when it does grow big, he may have somebody else preaching from this pulpit. I don't know, but I have to accept his will, his timing, his purpose. This isn't my church. This is his church. And he's just using me as an instrument, even if it's just for a temporary, on a temporary basis. Now, sure, I would love to be part of, of the growth here and to see it grow, to see more people come to know Jesus, because ultimately that's what really matters. That's what I really want to see. I don't want to see just chairs full. I want to see more people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, to be saved. I don't want to have these chairs full. No one, you know, everyone just remains unbelievers. No, I want to see the kingdom grow. I want to see lives change. I want to see marriages restored. I know what the power of God can do. I know what the strength of God can accomplish. And so many times that I've been weak, it's been so hard to go on, but he's giving me the strength. Every single week, he's giving me the strength. Keep in mind, again, it's, it's, it can be difficult. Um, I work a full-time schedule at my job. I work from 10 p.m. to 8 in the morning. I deal with a lot of things going on there. I'm always on high alert, you know, my head on a swivel. I got to have a certain demeanor, make sure no one, you know, I don't, I don't look, you know, in a way that someone's going to take advantage of me. And that can be exhausting. I re- keep my normal work schedule on Saturday nights. So usually when I'm here, I haven't gotten any sleep the night before. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm used to it. That's fine. I'm not complaining about it. What I'm saying is that there have been times where I'm just, you know, leave my house on Sunday morning and it's, it is difficult. But the Lord, He gives me the strength that I need. He gives it to me. It's not me. I, I'm powerless. Again, I, I know myself, and I just would have given up years ago. No, he gets me through, and he can do, my point being is he can do the same for you. He can do the same for all of you. And maybe he has done that for you. And if he has, testify to it. Tell those who you know are going through a difficult time, who do feel weak, to just hold on to the Lord, to trust in God, to rely on His strength. He will get them through that time. Let me go back to what I was saying. I think I went on a rabbit trail there, but again, believers shouldn't despise the day of small things. All ministries are important in the kingdom of God. Whether it's those working in the media, those helping, uh, greeting at the door, cleaning up. My wife, who is with the kids. Isaac, who just does all kinds of things. Um, All ministries are important. Teachers, cleaners, everything. They're all important in the kingdom of God. Every Joshua, every ministry leader, every Joshua needs a Caleb who is a switch flipper. 
like the co-pilot that Sully had. They need someone who was reliable. God called Joshua to lead and called Caleb to walk alongside aside him, assisting him in ministry. So there must be a sense of unified diversity in the ministry of the church. What do I mean by that? There are people whose names will never be put on the church website. There are those who will work in nursery rooms and change diapers and give children milk and oatmeal and cookies. However, some of those children will turn out to be the next Billy Grahams, Martin Luther King Jr.'s, Corey Ten Booms. Think of all those great Christians, all those leaders that you admired, that you look up to. They all, they grew up in the church, had a Bible teacher, uh, maybe you know, someone gave them milk and cookies in children's ministry. Yeah, you just never know. Some of those will be great people, great men and women of God. There has to be a sense of unified diversity that mirrors, oh, there will be a sense of unified, there ought to be a sense of unified diversity that mirrors the end time reality when people will one day say, when people from every tribe and language and people of na- and, and nation will say with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered and receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Man, woman, you know, it doesn't matter what nationality, what race you're, you know. The church here ought to be, ought to look like what it's going to look like there in the kingdom of heaven. Not one, nor will I ever condone any kind of biases, you know, because one's at a different economic class than another, because one is more beautiful or handsome than the other, because one is older and one is younger. No, I, in this church, while we're, while I'm here, Never, we, will ne- we won't discriminate. And there ought to be no discrimination in any church. We want, I want this church to be as unified and diversified as what we will see one day in the kingdom of heaven when we will be again saying with a loud voice, worthy is a lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So let me conclude by saying this. Caleb had waited 45 years to see the promise of God fulfilled in the acquisition of Hebron. Finally, God's promise came true. He was rewarded for his patient loyalty. How long can you wait on God's promise made to you through his word? Can you wait through disappointments, moments of wandering, and the rejection of congregations you're serving or where you were at? 
Those are difficult. Those are hard times. But can you remain patient and wait through all that and wait on God's promises made to you through His Word? Can you trust God will keep His promise to you as He did to Caleb? Again, let me remind you what Caleb said in the beginning of verse 10. Of verse 10. He said, as you see, the Lord has kept me alive these 45 years as He promised. Later on in Numbers chapter 14, verse 24 it says that the Spirit of God rested on Caleb and gave him a different spirit and disposition. This was evident through his complete devotion to God. He was confident based. His confidence was based on what he had seen God do at the Red Sea, in the wilderness, and in the conquest of Canaan. This enabling power of God equipped Caleb to face the giants in the hill country of Hebron. He would be able to defeat the imposing men and take possession of that territory. Well, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord God rested on Jesus too. For God anointed him to preach the gospel and carry out his three-year ministry. Guess what? He will do the same for you. For each and every one of you. Whatever ministry that is, whatever capacity it is, it, it'll be in serving him, serving the church. His spirit will rest. God's spirit will rest on you. And you'll see it's, it's a different type of work than having to do your regular job because you have to. And this, this kind of ministry, this kind of, when the Holy Spirit is in you, you, there's a joy. There's a joy in doing it. You don't mind. It's because you know you're doing it for the Lord. You're not doing it for anybody else. You're not doing it to get brownie points. You're not doing it to get notoriety. You're not doing it to get your name up there. No. You know, I, I know people here that have said, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be up here, or up there, and I just want to be, you know, just that person in the background. I just want to serve. It's wonderful. That's great. You know, I mean. And the Lord sees that. The Lord sees that the heart behind that person. It's not about making a name for themselves or anything like that. No, it's just about it's just doing it because they love the Lord and they want to serve the church. Brothers and sisters in Christ, serve. Serve willingly. Serve unapologetically. Serve humbly. It's a lot of, you know, this church, it does, it may appear small, but you know, a lot of things that you can, everybody here can help out with. You know, many of you know that sometimes, you know, I like to spend time with new visitors, and so, you know, there's a lot of stuff that still needs to be, that needs to be done after service. Or maybe someone else needs prayer. Someone needs some, you know, someone to talk to. Isaac and I and, and Robin, we can't be there all at once. You're helping out. You're serving by being that person they, that, that they can pray with. So again, I encourage you. Serve. God's anointing, if you really are born again, His Holy Spirit lives in you. And He will help carry out your ministry for however long it is. For some of you, it could be just a few years. 
maybe for others, it could be for the next 45 years, 85 years, maybe 90. Someone can tell me, well, how was Chuck Smith before he passed away? How old was he when he died? I think he was in his 90s, I believe. Mid to late 90s. And he preached the Wednesday before he passed away. His ministry wasn't over until he breathed his last. And I feel the same way. My ministry will never be over until I breathe my last. And so should you. You should feel the same way. See, friends, the victories won in your life are to magnify Christ who leads you from victory to victory. Maybe some of you here watching, listening, who are just, just going through some really hard times right now, and I get it. We've all been there. Let me reiterate again, if that's you, Grab on to the Lord. If you've fallen or walked away, He's there with His arms extended, waiting for you to come back. He wants to give you that strength that you, you need. And many of you know what I'm talking about. I have experienced it. When I fell for the Lord, for, uh, when, I, when I fell and walked away from the Lord for 10 whole years or longer, He was there the moment I cried out for Him. When I was just done, when I was just done fighting and wanting to do things my own way, He showed His grace to me. That is so wonderful. And Again, some of you have know what I'm talking about. So again, if you're going through a hard time, you've walked away, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and he will give you exactly what you need. For those of you who have been walking for a long time, for years and years, and been patiently been waiting on the Lord to fulfill his promises to you. Don't give up. Remain steadfast. Continue to be patient. Continue to be loyal. Keep being obedient. Don't give up. I know it's difficult. But you're not alone. I want to take a minute to speak to those who are watching and listening and you're hearing this and you're like, I, I, I think I need Jesus. You do. You need Jesus. And I want to invite you to come to the cross. Lay your sins before him and ask him to forgive you to make you new, to make you born again, to give you a new life, a new, fresh vision of this world, of your family, of yourself. He wants to offer, he wants to give you the promises that are found in his word. He wants to give them to you. So if you're ready to do that, you now see your need for Jesus and want him to be the Lord of your life. Wherever you're at, wherever you may be, I just want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And with all sincerity, with all your heart, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I now truly believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I repent 
I turn away from my sins and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me, fill me all the way with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me and show me more of the Father's ways, more of your ways, to be able to love more, show grace, show more grace, show more compassion, more mercy, to love my enemies. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may remove all the junk that's in my heart. I want it to be completely filled with you. Fill me so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name I pray this. Amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.